The C has a lot of different parts. And really, what I've shown you is that there are genes that are active in a seed-specific way, and some of them are active in different parts. But what we really want to know is a lot more than that. That's just the tip of the iceberg. What we really want to know is what is every single solitary gene that's active in every single solitary cell type, in every tissue, in every region, throughout all of seed development. So we have this dictionary of words that, that we can use as a raw material to find the important genes that we can use to increase seed yield and eventually uh, the food supply. And so here's a little graphic, a little clip to remind you this is the outer part of the seed. This is the wall which we're building up. This is the wall again. All of this blue is part of the wall. This is the protective layer of, in this case, a soybean seed, not this model Arabidopsis crop. This is the nutrient tissue, the endosperm. Here's the embryo, which becomes the whole plant. And this is this little nurse cell, the suspensor, which will decay at the end of seed development. So what are the genes required to make a seed? And so what I want to share with you in the next few slides is something which is brand new, something which uh, hasn't got pen to paper yet, uh, very fresh off of the press. But what it really describes for the first time ever is every gene that's active in every part of the seed at every time of development. And let me share those data with you. Why soybean? Obviously, soybean is a major food crop. Soybean is the second important crop in the United States. It's a major food source. It's a major source of biodiesel. It's an excellent model plant now. I've used it going back almost 30 years as a tool to understand seed biology. Uh, it's sequenced, the genome has been sequenced most recently, which has helped us and everyone else tremendously. And also, it's a major funding source. For those of you who don't work with plants, you should be aware of the fact that our funding is much more restricted compared to people who work in the biomedical area. Uh, and one of the things that uh, is being done now is if you're working on plant research, and you want to get funding, uh, and you want to get significant funding, you need to work on a crop, a major crop. And what we chose to work on for these things was soybean, for many, many different reasons. Again, here's a cross section through a seed. I'm not going to go into it again. This is one that is shortly after fertilization. We're mostly interested in that stage because that's when all the differentiation is occurring. That's when all the different cells and tissues and everything else is forming. But the question is, how do you get at this? How can you study a particular cell type in a seed? Remember, the seed is buried. The embryo of the seed is buried in the fruit. The fruit is where the seeds form. And then the seed has all these different tissues. How do you get at specific tissues in order to study the genes that are active in specific parts of the seed? And what we use is a technique called laser capture microdissection. We have a microscope. Uh, here's what the soybean seed looks like in a section under the microscope. Here's this nurse cell. Here's the embryo, which becomes the plant. And here's what it looks like in the cartoon. This is shortly after fertilization. And then what we can do is use a laser in the microscope. As you can see, we take that laser, we cut out specific cell types, in this case, particular regions of the embryo or of the seed. It drops by gravity, as you'll see. We can then get those tissues, get the RNA out of those tissues, and study what genes are active in these little tiny parts of the embryo. And you can do that for every single solitary part of the seed, as you can see. And using that tool, along with gene chips, that is microarrays, you can then study what genes are active throughout development and in every part of the seed. And we've done that. And we've used, in this particular case, again, a microarray. The microarray has about half to 60% of the genes on it in the soybean genome. It was created before the soybean genome was sequenced, um, but it's clearly representative of a lot of genes. And more importantly, it has a lot of regulators of other genes, transcription factors. And so we think that we can use this to find out uh, some very important information about genes that are active during seed development. And furthermore, we've created a website 
which is very interactive. And if you can go on this website and look at any of our data, download it, do anything you want with it, it's extremely interactive, and you can do basically anything you want with the data. And one of the reasons why we collect it on this particular website is, in fact, because it's for the scientific community. So let me just tell you a very short story. And I'll try and conceptualize it uh, because it's not important to go into the numbers. The first concept is if you look in any different part of the seed, the epidermis, other tissues of the seed coat, the nutrient tissue, the embryo, you see about the same number of genes that are active. And again, these are minimal numbers because we're not working with a whole genome set of genes. But we think it's representative. We know we don't have all of them, but we think it's pretty representative. Furthermore, you can see that each of these particular parts of the seed has about a thousand different transcription factors. And again, that's the holy grail. What are they doing in the outside of the seed, in the embryo, in the suspensor? And furthermore, what you can see is again, much like what I told you with the Arabidopsis, there are small numbers of genes, including small numbers of transcription factors that are specific at the level at which we are working for every single part of the seed. So what does that mean? That means that every part of the seed has a unique set of genes, and those unique set of genes are probably involved in the differentiation of that part of the seed and or the functioning of that part of the seed. And clearly, we want to find that out because we want to know what they're doing to be able to differentiate the different parts of the seed from fertilization onward. But as you can see, what you can see here is, is that most of these genes are shared by different parts of the seed. So there's few seed-specific transcription factors, few seed compartment-specific genes, but many of the genes that are active are shared throughout all of the different parts of the seed shortly after fertilization. However, they're highly regulated, as you can see. Even though they're shared, many of them are upregulated, and you can see that each different compartment has a set of genes, not only that are specific, but a set of genes that are upregulated. And some of them are markers of important processes. For example, this layer of cells is transferring nutrients in from the mother plant into the embryo. And if you look at some of the genes that are active in this cell layer, what you can see is they're involved in transport. And we've been able to identify some of them, as you can see, as ATPases and other things. And you say, well, why would this be important? Well, if you can engineer these transporters to transport nutrients more efficiently into the embryo and into the seed from the mother plant, you might be able to get bigger seeds, more food inside the seeds, and be able to help with this yield problem somewhere down the road. So clearly, there are compartment and region-specific genes and transcription factors and genes that are upregulated in the context of the seed. The question really becomes, what are the genes required to make a seed? How many are required? So what you can do is you can take the numbers that we get from taking the messenger RNAs from a whole seed, and you can compare that from the union of all of these mRNA sets individually, and you can add up everything, and what you see is two important things. One, we can find about minimum 22, 23,000 different genes required to make a seed after germination. And furthermore, what you can see is that that's not that different from what we get when we just grind up the seed as a whole, take the RNA, run a gene chip experiment, and see what we get. You can see there's only a difference of about 2,000. It's only a difference of about 200 transcription factors. So that says, one, there's about 23,000 genes required to make a, gene, a seed after fertilization. And two, it says, and it confirms what I showed you before, because there's not a big difference between when we add up all of these gene sets with this gene set, it says that most of the genes and most of the transcriptional regulators are shared within the seed by different compartments. And that makes a lot of sense because you know the genome is of a finite size. It can't have specific regulators for every single thing. And so different genes are used in different combinations in different parts of the seed 
And that's probably uh, what we're observing. Now the question really becomes, and I think this is the hardest question, what are the genes in all of the cell types, in all of the stages of development, in all of the times of development? And what I want to summarize for you is about 50 to 60 experiments of about 5 to 6 million data points or more. And I want to summarize them in about two or three slides and show you what the results are. And the conclusion really is, before I show you the data, is that there's a lot of overlap in genes that are utilized throughout development of a seed. There's a lot of overlap in genes that are utilized in different compartments of the seed, but yet we can find specific regulators of specific times in development, as I showed you with the Rhabdopsis, specific regulators of specific compartments in space, uh, specific regulators of a variety of different parts of the seed, and clearly, again, that's the holy grail, which is making it all happen and once we find out those connections in the genome, we'll really understand how a C is made. And here is the summary of a huge number of experiments. And I'll just go over them briefly. We find between 21 and 24,000 genes that are active in a C at different stages. By adding up all of the different profiles that we got from capturing all of these different cell types using lasers during C development. And furthermore, if you add all of this up, it's about 26, 27,000 minimal numbers required to make a seed. Conceptually, that means about the same number of genes are active at any stage of seed development. Conceptually, it means about the same number of genes are active in any compartment or tissue or cell type of a seed. Conceptually, it means that there's a huge overlap of genes that are utilized at different stages of development. And why do I say that? I say that because if you take all of these different sets of genes and you add them up and you do the union of these set, sets, you can see not that different a number in the union as compared to uh, each individual stage. And so what that means is that a lot of these genes are used over and over and over again, same story. But clearly you can find genes that are unique in a spatial temporal way. So you take all of these millions of data points you put them in a computer, you allow them to sort out, you say, what are the genes that are active at a specific time, in a specific place of the seed? You find, again, very few numbers that are specific. And again, I only want to focus on the seed coat, which, are the, which is the protective layer of the seed. And if you look in the seed coat for genes that are specific, what you can find is something interesting. Here's the soybean seed, they're brown. You can see that the genes that are specific at a particular time of development encode enzymes that are responsible for that brown color. And in fact, you can also find regulators that are perhaps regulating those enzymes that are involved in producing those brown, that brown color. And so clearly then, you can find markers and regulators of particular times of development of the seed, of particular cell types, and things that are very important in contributing to what the seed is doing. And furthermore, as I've said, and I've said this again, it's kind of a theme, most of the genes that are active in the seed are shared. And here's literally millions of data points that have been pulled together. I'm not going to go into how we sort them out, but again, red is high and green is low. And there's two important new things that we found. First thing that we found is that early in the development of the seed, right after fertilization, the genes are activated in particular tissues and stay activated irrespective of time. In other words, a set of genes come up right after fertilization, let's say in the epidermis of the seed. And those genes stay in the active in the epidermis throughout the early stages of seed development. So there's a spatial regulation of gene activity early in development. That makes a lot of sense because this is when all of these different tissues and cell layers are being differentiated. However, later in development, when the seed is switching from differentiation into preparing for dormancy, we find a temporal program. In other words, there's a large set of genes that are upregulated later in development, and you can see that those genes are active throughout the entire seed, irrespective of tissues. So what I'm saying is early in development, genes are activated with respect to tissue, irrespective of time. 
Later in development, they're activated with respect to time, irrespective of tissues. This is one of the most fascinating things that we've learned from all of this massive amount of data. And clearly, we want to know how, that pro how those processes occur and clearly what these genes do. OK, let me wrap all of this up. We have, Tomo, can I have the lights on for a second? We have a set of words. We have a dictionary. In a very short number of slides that I've tried to conceptualize for you, we really have a collection of genes that we know are doing what they're supposed to be doing throughout all of seed development. And I don't think anyone really has been able to do this yet, at least in plants. In other words, we know what every gene is that's active any time in any cell type in any part of a seed throughout all of development. So those are the words. We need to learn how those words are strung together and connected, particularly the regulators, how they're connected in circuits in the genome, and how they're read on and off during seed development in order to make a seed. If you can find that out, you can engineer anything. In other words, just as I showed you with this left gene, you can engineer genes that will do things that the normal plant can't do. But theoretically, you can make bigger seeds, as I've shown you. You can make more seeds, more nutritious seeds. You can alter almost anything in the seed. And I think we have the raw material in order to do that. But clearly, you need to know, if you're going to do that, what the sequences are in the chromosomes that are responsible for switching the genes on and switching the genes off in different parts of the seed. Tell me if I can have lights down. So what we want to know then is we have a collection of genes that we know is active everywhere in the seed and every time of seed development. But what we really want to know is what's responsible for switching those genes on and switching them off or upregulating them or downregulating them at particular times in the development of the seed. And so one can do this uh, again in the lab by genetic engineering. And so here's a gene that we know is active in the nurse cell of the embryo, the nurse cell of the seed. As you can see here, here's the gene, here's its regulatory region. What we want to do is mutate in the lab chemically all the different DNA sequences in that regulatory region and then look for those sequences that we've changed where we lose the marker gene in that part of the seed. And we've begun to do those kinds of experiments. And clearly, we want to do this for every part of the seed so we know what's in the genome turning genes on and off in different parts of the seed. And that's really the holy grail. And so just to summarize a whole bunch of experiments, uh, one real experiment, which you can see here, here's a gene that's active, as you can see, by this blue color. It's in a transgenic tobacco plant. You can see that it's active in the nurse cells as a sensor. We've mutated its regulatory regions, uh, 15 base pairs at a time. And what you can see is you get to this region here, you lose activity in that part of the seed. So this is a seed-specific gene, a, a, a gene that is specific for a particular part of the seed. And furthermore, when you mutate it in its regulatory region, you lose its transcription in a particular part of the seed. And there it is. And furthermore, we know in that region there's short nucleotides that are conserved. It's about 10 bases. We know what those 10 bases are. And furthermore, when we take those and we engineer them in a different context, you can see that only those sequences are required to program transcription in that part of the seed. So what we want to know in reality is for all the genes that are active specifically in different parts of the seed, what are the sequences in the genome that are doing that? And that really, as I said, is the holy grail. And furthermore, here's a little model in the second to last slide, which shows here's the sequences. We think there's some transcription factors that are interacting with them. We don't know what they are specifically, but we certainly know what they all are, because here are all the transcription factors that are active in this part of the embryo. And clearly, we have a list of transcription factors that are active in every part of the seed, every cell type. And what we need to do is be able to put these together with these sequences we're uncovering. And if we can do that, the key is to try and understand how the genome is read out from fertilization to the dormant seed, what all the genes are doing, and how it's choreographing, much like that film, with all of these different particular processes.
So I have a couple things to say before I close. First thing is just to summarize what I said. There's genes that are active in a seed specifically, and many of those are regulators, and they have to be doing something which is very important to the seed. There's genes that are active within the seed in specific places, in specific compartments, in specific regions, and those have to be doing something that's responsible for the differentiation of those particular regions. And so clearly then, we're beginning, as I said, to uncover some of the sequences that are responsible for activating these genes in different parts of the seed. Two last things. I know I said two and I said three, but there's really two last things. First thing is, can you turn off the lights just a minute and we'll thank you. First thing is that I'm just a messenger. It's clear that I've been blessed through all of these years of having some phenomenal graduate students, postdocs, and undergraduates work in my lab. They're the ones that do the work. Uh, I'm just the one that tells you about what they found. And so what I'd like to do is acknowledge all the people in my lab, if I can have the light sound fellow uh, that are there now and have been responsible for this work. Uh, a lot of the gene chip experiments were carried out by Anzu Bui, senior scientist in my lab, uh, and Chen Chang, working in the lab as a senior research associate. All of the bioinformatics, at least initially, was done uh, by Brandon Lee, a brilliant PhD student who also helped me with all of these slides and putting the movies together. Uh, we also have others, such as Min Chen, who's doing some of the validation work of the gene chip experiments. Kelly Henry, who's doing many of the experiments to show where the genes are active within the sea. And we have some wonderful undergraduates, Daisy Robinson, Becca Charney, another postdoc, Jungmin Hur, who's doing some of the other experiments on soybean gene profiling. Uh, and clearly, then, we have, last but not least, uh, Tomo Kawashima, who's working the lights back there, who's responsible for identifying some of these sequences that are important for activating and maybe repressing genes in different parts of the seed. There's been others that have been involved in this project. Former lab members, Javier Wagmeister, Jin Jin Wong, Chun Dai Lee, and I can't help but acknowledge our collaborators at UC Davis uh, because it is a collaboration. It's one big family. Uh, John Harada, his students and postdocs, and clearly uh, an NSF grant uh, that has allowed all of this to take place uh, because all the things that we do is expensive and it takes a significant bank account. And so not only am I the messenger for the people in the lab, I'm also a bank, uh, which I like to do, and they're doing some terrific stuff. So thank you to all of you in the lab who's allowed me to communicate all of this wonderful work uh, to the audience. But what I want to do is just finish on a different note. And I want to show you a few things that I think is very important in this day and age that brings me full circle back to the theme of feeding the world and increasing the food supply and increasing yield and something that I feel enormously passionate about. And that is the situation that's going on in agriculture and plant biology with respect to genetic engineering around the world today. We're in an ironic situation. The question is how are we going to increase these yields in this ironic situation in which Science is really more exciting than it's ever been. Even today, Brandon in my lab said that there was another plant genome, the palm genome, was sequenced. There's never been a more exciting time to be in biology. This is the most exciting time that I can ever remember in my entire career, because now we're beginning to understand the mechanisms that, and again, with respect to plants, make a plant a plant or a seed a seed. And you can see here is all the plant genomes, that data ready as of today, uh, that have been sequenced. We know all the genes in this, these genomes. We don't know what they do, but at least we know what they are. And furthermore, many of the genes contribute to the traits that we need to know and use and manipulate in order to increase yield and increase the food supply. And I've showed you some that may be involved in seed number, seed size, but clearly growth rate, organ size, architecture, flowering time, uh, genes that make better uptake of nutrients, 
resistance to drought, heat, all of these things contribute to making a better crop and contribute to higher yields. And furthermore, many of these genes have been used in bioengineered crops, uh, which are dominant in the United States today with respect to both corn, soybeans, and also cotton in Canada, canola, some of the things that we've been involved with genetically engineered for hybrids and canola. If you go in Canada, where I was just last week in Saskatchewan, you can see tons of canola fields that have some of the genes that we discovered in our lab right in them uh, that have at least 30% higher yield in <laughs> canola oil. So clearly there's been an adoption of bioengineering and an adoption of bioengineered crops more rapidly than anything that's ever been done in agriculture before. And furthermore, despite what you might think or read, many of these bioengineered crops are helping poor people. In fact, the most significant benefits of bioengineered crops using genetic engineering have been poor farmers. Pesticide use has been going down because of insect resistant crops. Profits have been going up. And incomes of these farmers have been going up. And if you're only making $300 a year, and your income goes to $700 a year, that's a huge increase in income, which can be very significant in terms of what you do with your family, and how you survive, and how you prosper. Nevertheless, for the last decade, there's However, been a bad genetic engineering has not been universally welcomed. There is a small but vocal group of people, primarily in Europe, who are opposed to the use of genetically modified crops. The point is, over the last 10 years, those of us who do this have been engaged in a battle, and it has been a battle, and it's consumed an enormous amount of intellectual and financial capital in order to be able to convince people that these are the safest crops, the safest plants, the most tested crops that have ever been produced in the history of mankind. In order to get a genetically engineered crop into the field it takes 10 years of testing and $20 million. In order to get a new peanut plant, which has been developed by conventional breeding that is full of allergens, which is responsible for killing 3,000 people a year because they're allergic to peanut allergens, requires no money and no regulation. One can put a conventional crop onto the field without any regulation or oversight, but a genetically engineered crop in which you know what the gene is, what its structure is, where it goes in the genome, that it is not an allergen, that it's been tested for, two, for a decade, and at a cost of, as I said, 20 million. It's a contradiction. And so I like to say, would you rather eat peanuts that have allergens, or would you rather eat corn that's completely pesticide-free and ultimate in what I would consider uh, organic seeds? But clearly, I think this debate, other than affecting what I do, shutting down plant research in Europe, shutting down any kind of field testing in Europe, shutting down a lot of good work, it has had an effect on real people. And that is try exporting to, let's say, starving people in Darfur, good genetically engineered Illinois corn. And that produces a big controversy for a variety of different reasons. And it has affected other people in the world as well because of the stifling of agricultural research. Shown in this clip. Yeah, the, what is it? The principal form of fuel, because there's no electricity. Yeah, the lights down. And wood is in short. They're burning. They're burning this. You see here, this is a typical kitchen. And you see the dung's burning. And, and they live in this. This is in their huts this time. Yeah, this smoke normally stays within the hut for a long time because these children are breathing the smoke all the time. Here, stuff us who do not live in this condition fail to realize that agriculture is not their lifestyle, you know, it is their occupation. It's an economic activity. Most of us seem to romanticize their agriculture as their lifestyle. It's not for them, if you ask them. Which means that if these people can improve their agricultural productivity, they would have a better income, which would improve their quality of life, quality of housing, quality of everything. If technology can bring benefits, I think it will be criminal on our part to deny them the option to utilize and gain maximum advantage that a new technology can provide. 
So clearly this debate has affected real world, has affected real people, and has stifled in many parts of the world the development of technology that can help people. And so what I want to end with is a clip which is one of my favorite clips uh, by a friend of mine who's a professor at the University of Kent in England, Frank Ferreri, who I think really has summed up this debate really, really well in a very beautiful, almost poetic See, I've got no problem if you decide like, to live in the past and if you want to deny yourself the potential and possibilities that technological change brings about. That is your business, that is your affair. What I'm concerned about is if you burden the people of Latin America, Asia, and Africa with your prejudice, most people in this globe are still relatively poor. Most people are still having to struggle to survive. Unless we find a solution to the problems of everyday life that they face in Africa or in Asia or Latin America, they aren't going to improve their, the quality of their life. And if they're going to be poor, the whole of humanity is going to be impoverished by that, by, by that process. So in that sense, anti-scientific thought is not just simply about science. Anti-scientific thought is ultimately anti-people. Being the ever optimist I am, I'm hopeful that this debate will wind down and that eventually we'll be able to transfer some remarkable technology that has the potential to really help people that are needed, help that need help in the developing world. And hopefully with some of the information that we've collected in the lab, we'll be able to not say that this is the end of this talk, but in reality it's just the beginning, the beginning of understanding all of the genes that make a seed. So eventually we can make a giant seed and increase yield and the food supply in the world. Thank you all very much.